The next is food is connection. Okay, so think about what is the latest thing that you have done where you went out to celebrate with friends, family, or people that you adore and you included food? What have you done lately? Have you ever had a potluck? Or a big old braai? Or decided to have a dinner to celebrate? There's a lot of ways in which food is this important point of connection. Traditionally, right? The heart of the home was the heart, right? And when we think traditionally, like, and so many of us may even have this image, I can see my grandma in the kitchen all the time. My grandma was always in the kitchen. I could walk in at any time, and I could say, what's cooking? There was always something happening with meal prep. And you know what? We'd sit around the kitchen, and we would talk. How are things going? Right? The hearth was like the home for, for like, generations. And we're losing part of that touch, right? The way in which food has been a part of family and community. Right? We have so many weird connections, right, with food. Food, we have all these emotional attachments and memories connected. So I'm going to share with you, like, really one of the most uh aha food moments I have had in the last decade. So my current 11-year-old, his name is Pry, and he, like, came out of the chute addicted to sugar. Out of, like, oh, like, this kid, when I clean his room or he cleans his room, it's, like, hidden wrappers and it's crap food, Like, from the beginning, this kid has been a cheater and a stealer. Ugh, drives me insane. And his older sister, who is only two years older than him, like, her favorite food was broccoli, and she eats her Brussels sprouts, and she is one in the house that makes all the kale chips. And then the second one is Kai. So I remember this one day. This is my deepest food is connection moment. It was, like, transformative for me. So, as I mentioned to you, my brother passed away just a few years ago. And it is Minnesota. It is March in Minnesota. I think that might, I mean, it is cold. And I am in the garage in my fuzzy socks and my pajamas, and I am in the corner eating out of the tub of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Hiding and eating mint chocolate chip ice cream in the garage so nobody. And my son Kai comes running out the door into the garage, coming out to look for something because he's like, it's cold. So he comes running out in the garage and he like stops and this look of horror and pleasure that I have yet to witness. He was like eight when this happens. And like just, I can see his face right now. Mom, what are you doing? Oh my God. And I look at him and I go, Get back in the house! <laughs> I was like, ah! Oh. And then I like, I'm mad, right? I'm like, oh, busted by Kai of all people. <sighs> right? And I know he's in there telling everybody. Guess what mom's doing? Mom's out in the garage eating an ice cream. Out of the container! Oh my God, the shame and humility. And you know what? It like, it was so profound. Like it literally, it made me stop. And I go like, what the hell am I doing? Right? Like this is not aligned with my values and my intellect and my knowledge. Right? And then I literally do in this moment, thank goodness, my little subconscious says, do the Deanna Minnick, why, why, why? <laughs> And I remember like 10 years ago, Deanna Minnick teaching in a workshop I was in with her. And she said, you know, like when you're really struggling with the craving, why, why, why yourself? So I did. And so like you take a moment, you pause and get centered if you can. And you think, why am I eating this ice cream? And it was like instantaneously, like, why am I eating this ice cream? And I'm like, because I'm sad. And I can see myself in that moment. It was the first time I ever connected these dots. I could see myself being a little kid, and every single time I got sick, my mom would take the day off work, and she'd stay home with me. And, like, part of my love and super good nutrition and Shackley vitamins plan was I would get a little tiny bowl of mint chocolate chip ice cream. Like, my mom would give me a tiny little bowl of ice cream, and as I'm looking at this, I'm realizing that mint chocolate chip ice cream, to me, means my mom is taking care of me. Even though we know I probably shouldn't be having the sugar right now, she still gave me a little bowl of mint chocolate chip ice cream. 
So then I was like, then I went down through these layers of the why, why, why. And in doing that, I came into owning the space that, like, my heart was cracked wide open. My mom just lost her only son. Right? He suffered from Lyme disease, and it was severe, and he had a head injury. And ever since that severe TBI, he was never well since. And it was a rapid, radically quick, fast decline. Right? But my point is, in that moment for me, I recognized that my mom is hurting. And all of a sudden, like I'm mothering my mother, and I'm having to figure out how to explain to my siblings that they've just lost somebody of utmost importance in their life. And what is my default? I'm eating mint chocolate chip ice cream in the garage in the winter in Minnesota. Because it like was just bringing me closer to my mom. And it was like so powerful, and it literally happened for me in like two minutes. And so from then on, when I have mint chocolate chip ice cream, I have it very consciously. Right? And for me, it was the most profound experience I've ever had in the ways in which food is connection. Right? I'd heard examples from my patients over the years. Right? So the first day I asked you, what is your favorite food? Do you remember that? What's your favorite food? Say it out loud. Noodles? What else? Chocolate? What else? Macaroni and cheese? Awesome. With seafood? With... What else? Krispy Kremes, yes. Honesty, authenticity, and vulnerability in the front row. Yes. What else? Ice cream. Come on. Oh, that's number two on my list. Actually, I would, I would have bacon with mint chocolate chip ice cream if you let me. <laughs> okay, so do you get my point? Okay, they're your favorite foods too. Okay, I didn't hear, uh, I love the elagic acid in raspberries. It's really important that I get the phytonutrients in my blueberries. Oh, kale chips. Well, I actually would say kale chips are number three on my list. Okay, but it's because I put Parmesan on them. I don't love them as much without the Parmesan. Okay, so when you look at your connections to food or you are exploring with your patients connections to food, can you find deeper meaning and understand why is this important? Right? Because many of the habits that our patients keep in their relationship to food is because they're connected to food for a whole host of other reasons. And you can tell them what to eat and tell them what to eat, tell them what to eat, but that is not why we make most of our choices. So lead with the intellect, support them with the knowledge, be realistic and inspire them to have their own transformative experience to realize what are their goals and are they going to be accomplishing those goals for the right reasons. Okay? So I'm saying this because, yeah, we have a lot of research and science behind food. We have a lot of tools behind food. But it's important to know that when it comes to nutrition guidance and dietary implementation, it's swirling around, right? There's a lot of influential factors at play. Okay? And it's not just the science. It's not just the what is the reason behind why we're going to continue to choose those foods. So know that as you are exploring the IFM food plans, all of these different food suites will always come to you with this whole package, and there's a methodology for you, your staff, whoever's on your team, there's a way that we're going to implement them. Okay? And it's the same flow with every tool. Okay? So the system is this. We're going to always choose the food plan first based on what are going to be the key elements of those foods that are going to meet the physiologic desires that we have for the food. Right? So the food lists are generated because they're connected to physiologic, physiologic shift and change for our patients. So what food plan are you going to pick first? Second, we're going to be looking very carefully at, now how might we go on and further tailor this food plan so it's a little more personalized for my patient's needs? Okay? And some of the food plans you're going to see have therapeutic foods highlighted. They're dark, they're blue, they're bold, they stand out. And then there's discussions about them in the education content. And then there's also some very practical and helpful things. There's menu planning ideas. There's shopping lists. There's a whole host of things that are there to help them get that first week up and started. Okay? And so then you can take it from there. So I would, I would star this. I would highlight this in your entire list of those nutrition-related do uh, documents. This is by far the most important tool that you and your staff, your team, on your collaborative care team model, it is the most important tool that you all read, okay? Most important tool. Because this is going to tell you how to do it. 
It's going to tell you how to personalize. Regardless of which of those food plans you're going to go for, this is a critical tool. So like I mentioned, and this week, you saw from Dr. Shilpa Saxena, you learned from Dr. Betty Bischoff, there's two primary food plans we're comfortable walking out of this week knowing how to use. But there's a whole host of other food plans that are there. So in your folders and on the toolkit, you're going to find this document. It's a two-sided. And again, this would be one of those that I would keep handy at the front desk or at a glance or in your office because this is your shortcut guide. This is your accelerant to find the answer. So what we've done is we have summarized on the left-hand side the key physiologic features of the food plans. And then moving across the top of this document, you'll see that we've given you then the name of those programs. This week, we're introducing to you the core food plan suite, cardiometabolic and elimination diet. They're circled here in our orange box. As you go on into the advanced practice modules, you dig deeper and deeper into these food plans and you add to them. Okay? It doesn't mean you can't play with them, use them, or read about them until you get to those courses. No, they're all in your toolkit right now. But I can't emphasize enough the value and importance of learning the foundational first intervention tools first. Okay? So in doing that, what it allows for you to do is scan down the list and say, wow, you know, if I am looking for a food plan that's really dedicated to supporting sugar detox, well, which food plans are going to offer that to my patient? And then you scan across and you'll see, boom, boom, oh, the Renew Food Plan and Detox should be where I go. Right? Or if you want a food plan that's related to lower glycemic impact, okay, in those scenarios and situations, you're going to be prompted and guided to go to the cardiometabolic food plan and you're going to look at the mito food plan and some of the variations of the mito food plan. Okay, so use this as an important and powerful reference guide so that you can say, what is my physiologic need? Okay, and where am I going to start? Okay, so this is to speed up your learning process and your retrieval process. So it's through our medical history, getting to know the patient, our ABCDs of nutrition physical exam data points. It gives us a launch point into these first foods. Now, I know you've seen these quite a few times this week, but I'm just reminding you. And you know what I would say? This PowerPoint deck is really designed to be a reference for you to jump back into and look at. Highly encourage you to print out this deck and maybe have it sitting in your office somewhere, maybe four or six slides to a page. It was designed to be kind of at a glance, I need to go back and I want to find stuff. Okay, the whole rest of this deck is there for you as kind of a whirlwind overview of what these primary food plans are and how do we implement them. Okay, so the three we want to be starting with is core and its variations. We want to be starting with cardiometabolic and elimination. And so what you'll see is we've been able to break down and give you some prompts and some ideas in regards to which food plan and why. And you'll see it's broken down into the timeline components, aspects of their history, their condition, maybe even integrating their diagnoses, and then again looking at the findings from the ABCDs. Okay? So in looking at the food plans, okay, I want you to be thinking about core food plan, which I'm going to give you more information on yet, second, elimination diet, and cardiometabolic. Okay, so core food plan is like a good, healthy, foundational, clean diet. It is the improvement from the horrible American diet. Okay, it's a good, healthy food plan. So you've got a core food plan with vegan, vegetarian, pescatarian options. And you've got cardio and you've got elimination. Can I have two minutes on the clock? And I want you to, with your whole group, kind of go around and quickly list off which of these food plans do you think you're going to use because of your clientele and the people that you're already seeing right now in your office. Okay? And you should also be honest if you're like, I'm not using these food plans at all. None of them. Right? All of them. None of them. If you can, talk about your level of comfort and what are you planning to implement when you get back into the office this week. So like I mentioned, the next steps of how we go on to personalize this information are going to be contained within the directive guide I mentioned earlier. So what you're going to see is we've got next step question to ask ourselves is, okay, now we've picked which food plan we're going to use. Some of them do, some of them do not have considerations for the various different types of protein, fat, and carb allowances, right? And that you'll see right on your, your spreadsheet. But you're going to see that the next thought we would have is, are we going to make a caloric recommendation? 
Are we going to be giving a specific allowance or cap or amount that we want them to eat? Or are we going to be varying the amount of food they're eating when they're exercising more vigorously comparatively to when they're not? Okay, so there's going to be these key steps for us to think about and move forward on. So every single one of these food plans on the front side of it is going to be listing the proteins, the dominant proteins, protein combined foods. It's going to list all of our good fats and oils. And when you flip that document over, you're going to see that it's going to list then all of our various different carbohydrates. So all of our fruits and veggies, um, you're going to see all of our key grains listed on that back side of the document. So every single food plan is going to follow that flow. Now, this is one of the critical documents that's sitting in your office or that your nutrition professional is using or whoever in your office is helping to implement that food plan. This is the reference chart that they'll either end up memorizing because of experience or they'll use as a go-to. Right? And what this shows us is for each of those food plans, there is a reason why we're tweaking the calories in a specific way. Okay? And again, as I mentioned, in each and every one of the advanced sessions that you go through, you're going to keep learning more and more about these food plans in that way. And then you can see many of them can be given without any caloric specificity if you just want them eating those healthy foods on the list. Okay? So there's a shift that you'll see going from core vegan, then core vegetarian, on all the way over to mito, mito keto, and mito keto flex, which is the version that was created in alliance with the approach to um, neurocognitive concerns, leveraging and based off of some of the work with the Bredesen team. So you'll see as those caloric shifts are happening, the calories are shifting amongst those macronutrients. We've got this sort of transition window. It, again, is like it's a spectrum that's shifting from one side to the other. So within those food plans, you're going to then have a directive to know, well, how much should my patient eat? Because we don't need or want our patients counting calories. That is not the goal. Okay? We can lose them pretty easily in that process. Okay? We have hired and have had some incredible support create these food plans. As I mentioned, with every one of these food plans, we're giving you the list, we're giving you the features, we're giving you ideas, and then as you move into each of the food plans, it's going to show you how much. Are we going to ask our patient to then fill in certain particular caloric amounts? So the core food plan I want to introduce to you, um, I, I hope that it makes sense to you foundationally, but this is sometimes called a transition diet, right? If it's just a way to get them off of their junk food diet and eating clean, healthy foods, quality and quantity, that's the core food plan. And it's a wonderful place to start, beautiful place to start with educating and supporting them and making some life changes in what goes in their mouth. Right? So this is fundamental. Who is it good for? It's designed to be given to everybody. Right? Now, you may end up getting to a point of more of, say, a keto diet or a paleo autoimmune diet or getting to the elimination diet. But if they're like eating out for two of their meals a day, they've got a junk food diet based food plan when you look at their journal, like, be realistic. They are not going to walk out the door and start an elimination diet next week. I mean, come on. Right? Like if they don't even know what a protein, fat, and carb is, it's hard. So look at the core food plan. It was designed that it could be given to all ages. And in every single packet, you're going to see that we've also given you this visual graphic. It is not meant to represent a plate. It's meant to show you the PFC ratio distributions as they're laid out for a 24-hour window. Right? So that it matches sort of the one-day food plan. All right, so you would give the food plan, and you're going to be filling in the numbers as to how much could or should they be integrating into their diet. So core food plan, it's foundational. And there are also three variations. That that includes animal products, clean animal products, right? Recommending free range and how to find clean, healthy animal products that you're using in your diet. There's the vegetarian, vegan, and pescatarian variations as well to draw off of. I just love this visual. If you do what you've always done, you'll get what you've always got, right? And it is really hard to change diet, okay? Some patients may say, you know what, this is just easier if I just radically change and start over. Just give me the list and tell me what to do, right? Others, it may take them time to get there, okay? So our goal is to make the shift in the transition. What many practitioners and nutrition professionals find is they start with the standard American diet, they start shifting them towards the core food plan. Then they get them into one of the more advanced therapeutic interventions until you accomplish the goals of care. And then you may be able to shift and adjust and get them into more of a maintenance plan. They may 
be able to go back to the core food plan, or they may have to stay on that personalized plan for life, right? That's what's happening over the course of your workup, your assessment, and getting to know them in their case. So the core food plan has a beautiful comprehensive guide, explains the basics of good, healthy, clean eating, and then the various breakdowns, again, you're going to see, like, look at all the white space that's showing up on the vegan version, right? There's just not as many foods that are there, right? But the same format and the same flow is going to be present. So in this flip book, I would turn these slides into some kind of a flip book or a reference guide. It gets you right into the heart of, for this food plan, what's the caloric distribution that I want to work with? Hey, and the more you do this and the more sophisticated your use of the tools become, you don't even have to look at these charts anymore. Like I can close my eyes and I can do a mito food plan or I can do the cardio food plan on a 1300, 1800, 2100, 2400 without even looking at them anymore. Okay, but what we're looking at is they're all structured the same. Okay, it's translational to make it practical and easy to implement. For that food plan and this distribution, we are always PFC, right? The ratio numbers are always proteins, fats, and carbs. And so you're going to have the same order or sequence listed on the food plan. Okay, it's going to start with your proteins, your concentrated proteins, legumes, dairy, and dairy alternatives, nuts and seeds. And okay, then on the right-hand side of that front page, it's going to list your fats and oils. Flip it over. It's going to be our two separated categories of veggies, right? We're going to have our veggie, which we're going to consider our non-starchy, and then our veggie number two, which is our starchy kind of root veggies, right? And when we're educating patients, we want them to understand that, that veggie number two list, I mean, that's literally like grains, it's like breads, like pastas in response to the insulin spike that flows. So we are separating these because of the glycemic and insulin impact that happens when we eat those foods. So you zip down the list and you fill them right in and you match the food plan. Now you'll see there's a lacto-ovo-vegetarian variation, there's the vegetarian and the vegan with soy, and there is a vegan without soy variation. Okay, so that you can meet the needs of patients that come into the office, and these were some of the hardest food plans that the team pulled together. So you had a robust discussion with Dr. Saxena, and you go in depth in reviewing the cardiometabolic food plan when you get to that advanced module. But as expected, this is where we're going to be dealing with our patients who are dealing with hypertension issues, metabolic syndrome, dysglycemic components and concerns, type 2 diabetes, and know that the line extension of this food plan, the, the next food plan that takes this one to a more sophisticated level is going to be called the mito food plan. Okay? And what's different about the mito food plan is it pulls off the gluten and the dairy, pulls off wheat and gluten. And it's more targeted towards fueling and supporting the mitochondria. And the base of that food plan is, of course, leveraging the important relationship back to the glycemic impact. I think just reinforcing what we heard this morning from Dr. Hazi. And they do a deep dive down into looking at the mito food plan, of course, in the energy module. So as we've covered this week, um, you've been exposed to the increased waist to hip circumference, body composition measurements. I mean, these are going to be some of the prompts that will indicate, yeah, this is going to be the right food plan for that particular patient. All right, so when we look at the why, right, the why, the why, why, why. How did my patient get to this point? We look at the diet and we look at some of the clinical symptoms. We're bringing forward the food plan as a solution in this way. So as you dive into the comp guide, you'll review and you'll read through again. We're leveraging the studies and the science. The Mediterranean diet is one of the most well-published with the highest level of science backing behind it that we have today. And there's multiple variations of the Mediterranean diet. Okay? And so we're, you'll see um, IFM has pulled that research to the front. And because of how common this food plan is given out, you're going to see that there's already three caloric variations that are printed with the numbers filled in. Okay, so you can use the blank one and personalize, or you can use one that's already preset to the 12 to 1400, 14 to 1800, and then 18 to 2200 range, which are the most common ones you're giving for those concerns. You've, of course, taken time to review and dive into the elimination diet. Again, you had that long discussion and implementation conversation with Dr. Bischoff. You know, you should be familiar with why we're implementing the elimination diet. Know that the line extension past the elimination diet, if you wanted to take it one step further, then consider the renew food plan. And honestly, after all my years, this tends to often be what I use for my advanced elimination diet, the renew food plan. Because for me personally, most of the patients that I want to put through that type of a food reduction process and rechallenge. They're dealing with blood sugar issues, metabolic toxicity, 
and this food plan helps me tailor and customize the calories while they're going through the elimination diet. So it keeps in mind the glycemic and insulin impact that's involved. Okay, so be thinking elimination diet and start to learn and dabble with the Renew food plan. Um, it does tend to be the number one prescribed food plan in my office. I use Mito and Renew more than any other food plan to date. And so it's wonderful in that the tools help with the reintroduction. And I know, I don't know if there was enough time spent in the how do we reintroduce, what's the order, and how do we do it. But we have written all that material up for you. It takes time getting comfortable with then how do I reintroduce. Okay? Just like with the elimination diet, we really want that patient to aim for that 21-day window. Same thing if you're implementing the Renew Food Plan. It's not designed for life. We want them to implement it for that 21-day window. So IFM has some great tools, not only in the packet, but some separate handouts that you can use to support your patient as they're doing that reintroduction process. So I want to close, transition the stage back to Dr. Lukaser, but I'm hoping that you can spend some time pulling out these food plans, looking at them, and thinking about for you yourself. Is there a food plan that you're going to commit to being able to start on and do? Right, the group elimination process is coming up. You can go through this together. Very exciting opportunity to walk the talk, start to read, learn the fundamentals, and know that every single program that IFM brings back to the stage for you is going to include how to use them with greater specificity and more personalization and patient precision. So I want to thank you. I'm please encouraging you again, take the time to put yourself in the center of that care process. When you get off the airplane or you're getting home this week, have the list. And you also have this big community. You've got this wonderful IFM, AFM, CP Facebook thread and page to play with as well. And you've got the larger group for those who are going through and a part of the certification process. So thank you for sharing the stage with you. It's been a wonderful week. And really, science and art come together in functional medicine. Thank you.